Welcome to the morning session on Thursday of the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative Summer Sandbox. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Shelley Rose from the History Department at Cleveland State University. And we're here with the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative team, Molly Buckley Marudis from the College of Education, Will Fistek, who is a graduate assistant with the Collaborative, and Kalita O'Brien, a graduate assistant with our Collaborative this summer. And we're welcoming um, Glenda Tonef Kotner from the College of Education and TK Quick, oh, I'm so sorry, Quickendall, um, for a presentation with. Um, with Will Fistek, our graduate assistant, <laughs> entitled Navigating Disruptive Times for Educators, How to Engage with Civility. And so welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having us. Um, so again, I'm uh, Glenda Kotner, and I'm gonna go ahead and um, begin the presentation um, since we've had our inter introductions already. Um, just to give you some background, um, I have a, a professional relationship with TK and we call her Dr. TK. Um, so we don't have to say her last name. And um, so, so that's the connection between um, TK and myself. And then Will was actually one of my students in EDB 604, which is a social foundations course. So um, that's kind of what brought the three of us together. And we did a planning meeting and noticed that a lot of what we were talking about had to do with disruption in, in the education system. So it reminded me of a paper that I had uh, written for Ashland University. And <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and, um, oh, and the, if you look in the chat, you'll see the, the link for, um, for the Jamboard site that we're going to use. Um, and so I'm going to go into that site and start going through the presentation. Um, but know that a lot of this is coming from um, the paper from Ashland. So hopefully um, everyone can, can see this. <clears throat> so our presentation is Navigating Disruptive Times for Educators and How to Engage with Civility. And I'm going to start by reading the um, introduction in, in the paper that I wrote. Elvin Toffler stated, one of the definitions of sanity is to tell the real from the unreal. Soon we'll need a new definition. Toffler's point was that technology and innovation are developing so quickly that in the near future, it will be harder to clearly define what is real and unreal. This quotation is interesting to consider within the context of how Americans receive information through technological advancements that lead to alternate realities. A person's perspective plays a critical role in how individual realities are formed. A headline from CNBC News on November 19th, 2020 read, Dr. Fauci says vaccinating people who disregard COVID as fake news could be a real problem in reference to the fact that a large percentage of Americans do not believe the current global pandemic is real. At the time Toffler made his statement about sanity and reality, could he have imagined that in 2020, Americans would live in a world in which a well-documented event such as COVID-19 that is grounded in science and facts would be denied as real by such a large percentage of the population. In the text, Leading Schools in Disruptive Times, How to Survive Hyperchange, Dwight Carter and Mark White in 2018, they, cons they consider disruption within the context of education, defining disruption as any invention or societal shift that gradually changes how schools operate. In 2018, Carter and White could not have predicted that a disruptive event such as COVID-19 would suddenly force changes within the educational system in America, forever altering, altering how schools operate. And so that was the introduction of um, the paper that I wrote. Um, the, the text was around this, this text that you see a picture of, um, and it focused on globalization, um, schools in disruptive times, and how quickly technology is, um, is, is pushing all of us forward. Um, in my writing, in, in, in reading that text, what I saw was a connection to Malcolm Gladwell. 
Um, he, he wrote The Tipping Point and another book that he wrote is uh, Blink and I would recommend both of those um, to you. Um, but with the, the tipping point, how little things can make big differences. He wrote that in 2000. Um, what's interesting about Malcolm Gladwell is actually his, his area of study was um, in, ep in epidemics. Um, and so a lot of uh, his work is grounded in this. And so there's some irony that we're connecting his work to the pandemic now um, in, this, in this presentation. Um, but you'll see that his, his uh, tipping point text is grounded in chaos theory um, with sociology and psychology. Um, and that there's this idea that products and messages and behaviors spread just like a virus does. Um, and again, it's grounded in, in epidemic study, um, big changes following from small events. And, and in the text, uh, looking forward, he says this, we need to prepare ourselves for the possibility that sometimes big changes follow from small events and that sometimes these changes can happen very quickly. So I think you can see how that sets us up here to uh, move into how the pandemic has uh, influenced us in education. Um, so back to Carter and White, who in 2018 um, were, were studying disruptions in schools. Um, they, they put together a survival guide for 21st century school leaders. Um, and they encourage us to look to the future so that we'll be ready for even more disruptions. And I think this is really the, the premise of, of the planning meeting that the three of us had in um, talking about what disruptive times we're in and, and how we can um, keep educators focused on that and, and getting prepared. Um, and so along with the survival guide, the authors pose seven major disruptions that our schools face. Um, again, as you read these, consider that these were written in 2018, but you'll, you'll see how some of these really connect with some of the issues of disruption that we're seeing now, um, the pandemic and uh, most recently critical race theory. Um, so we're looking, we're looking at student safety, technology, um, reform efforts, generational challenges, global readiness, diversity, and transparency. And in the text, they pose critical questions. Um, they ask us to consider what is being done in your school to prepare students for the global economy. What advances has the school made in how it is letting its students use technology? How is the school allowing parents to access information about their students and the school and the school without overwhelming staff members? What steps have been taken to keep students safe while creating a friendly learning space that promotes creativity and freedom of thought? <clears throat> and how has the district adjusted to millennials in its workforce, to Gen Z learning styles, and to the need to examine learning space to meet the needs of today's world? Um, I think you'll see a lot of connection between those five and the, and the pandemic. Um, the one that stands out to me is, is regarding, is number two around technology. And I found myself asking, uh, asking myself, um, it, it, did we as a, as a, as a school system um, across the United States, um, had we focused on number two um, more, especially in marginalized um, areas where perhaps technology was not as advanced um, and then having to switch into, um, you know, the, the virtual world of, of uh, education with the pandemic, if we had um, focused on number two, would we have been better prepared? And I think we could go through each one of those, but I'm not going to take the time right now, um, you know, in studying how those might have impacted um, the, ed the, the um, educational system in America um, in a way that we might have been better prepared. Um, I look at number four that focuses on freedom of thought and I think about um, the, the disruption around critical race theory right now that's creeping into the schools. And, um, and where is academic freedom, right, for, for teachers in terms of, of teaching, um, having choice in what they feel um, should be taught. Um, so in the future, um, Carter and White would say that controlling curriculum and content, delivering instruction, pacing guides, and assessment will become obsolete. 
Um, and for some of us in here, we may be going, yay, <laughs> I'd like to see a lot of that uh, either eliminated or at least toned down. Um, and they, they also point out that governing structures and institutional powers grounded in historical, societal, and cultural norms may slow the process. Um, and we certainly are seeing that now with the pandemic in terms of um, compliance with CDC guidelines and vaccination rates um, and you know, people um, having personal choice in whether they, they want to follow um, the guidelines or get vaccinated. Um, in, in my paper, this is not part of Carter and White, but this is some of my own observation and reflection as I was studying their text. Um, I point out that, that, um, that the text was written for educators, um, probably geared more towards administrators of um, schools. And it was kind of cautionary in, in saying, hey, we're not prepared for the future. Um, but it was also a lot of it around excitement, the excitement of progressivism, the excitement of where we're, we're headed. Um, and, and through that lens, as, as my, I consider my positionality as a, a white middle-class educated female, um, I was like, yes, yes, this is great. And then I flip over to my, my lens as um, my social justice lens, my years of um, urban education, um, and, and the un, my understanding of the system of poverty. Um, and all of a sudden I'm thinking some of these things, which I'll share with you. Um, I was thinking about, you know, the fact that COVID-19 death rates have impacted people of color at higher rates than their white counterparts. And I was thinking about the stratified educational system that we have and how the pandemic um, has really exposed the um, stratified system as we saw poor districts, primarily in urban areas, struggling to get working technology into the hand of students um, and how that transition was much smoother for um, students that um, had wealth and resources and had been using technology, functioning technology well, right? Um, and, and also thinking about the rural districts who really didn't get a lot of media attention, but still understanding that the rural districts were struggling more to transition into this um, virtual learning. So, so what does it mean to view something systemically and through a social justice lens? And I just kind of gave you an example. Um, and so, um, you know, this idea that I'm kind of going through this positionality of my own positionality, but yet um, so much of my world has been working with marginalized groups. So, so that is also part of my, my lens. Um, and so these are the questions that I came up with when Carter and White asked the question um, for us to consider, which is what does it mean to be educated in the 21st century? And again, you know, from their perspective, it was about excitement and, and um, you know, this hyper change movement um, and advancement of technology and, and all of that is so exciting. Um, but here's what I was left with thinking. Will the accelerating world only apply to wealthy in America? Will the hyper change movement only be experienced by those of power and privilege? And will advancements in technology further, further the divide between those of wealth and those of poverty. And when I read through those, I actually think about the most recent news with space travel and how um, space travel is now being privatized. Um, I don't know the cost to, to be able to um, fly into space, but I'm, I'm sure it's something that's beyond what I could afford. Um, and, and so that, you know, that's an example of how technology is moving so fast but yet it's also furthering um, the, the um, socioeconomic divide in, in the country. Um, so, so to think systemically, I rely on Peter Senge and Peter Senge's work is grounded in a lot of um, Deming's work as well. Um, and later I'm gonna show you a, a clip that where Peter Senge gives you a brief introduction to what systems thinking is. Um, but since reading that book, it has been life-changing for me in terms of even how I develop my um, curriculum in my courses. Um, and I don't, I don't know if we have a, a large audience today, um, so I'm not sure that, that we'll have a lot of sticky notes coming in. But on this slide, um, 
I wanted to focus on two things we've already talked about. One is the definition of disruption as, divine, as defined by Carter and White, um, as any invention or societal shift that gradually changes how schools operate. And I think we all agree that the pandemic um, qualifies um, in that definition. Um, and the other definition is tipping point. Um, the moment of, a crit of critical mass, the threshold, the boiling point. Um, big changes follow from small events, and sometimes these changes can happen very quickly. So focusing on those, um, those two authors, uh, um, I was asking some of my teams ahead of me, I was asking um, if you could reflect back in history um, on specific events that you would consider to be potential tipping points. Um, certainly September 11th, right, of 2001, 9-11 um, was, uh, you know, was a huge tipping point. Um, it, it, you know, had a, a tremendous policy reaction in this country um, into how we would react to terror, um, terrorists, um, policies that um, impacted certain um, ethnic groups of people, um, people grounded in specific religion. Um, their lives changed um, traumatically as a, as a result of 9-11. I could also point out that because of 9-11 and the divide that, that was going on and the fear, um, No Child Left Behind actually is a result. The passing of No Child Left Behind policy is a result of um, the 9-11, the tipping point um, of 9-11 and the policy changes. Um, the idea about No Child Left Behind was that we wanted to bring the country together um, and and stop the division. And one of the fastest ways they could do that was by moving No Child Left Behind through very quickly. And so with very little discussion um, because of 9-11, um, we ended up with No Child Left Behind. And we've got some other things, Black Lives Matter. Certainly um, if, if there ever was a tipping point, I think recently we would all agree um, the, the pain of, of uh, watching the killing of George Floyd um, that was that was um, videotaped certainly was a huge uh, tipping point. I think um, in terms of talking about race. Nice job, everybody. I'm going to move on. Thank you. Um, so so I promised I would take you in and show you um, something about Peter Senge, and I will. But before that, um, I'd like to start with. Um, I think I'm gonna start with Malcolm Gladwell and just show, oh, I gotta start over here, show a brief part of this video. So it's a little bit soft in volume, but hopefully you can hear it. Looking at police reform uh, at this moment when activists and protesters are, are demanding more action, and this despite President Trump signing an executive order on policing, they say it doesn't go far enough. Best-selling author Malcolm Gladwell uh, has written extensively about race and policing over the years, including the 1999 police killing of Amadou Diallo uh, right here in New York City. Gladwell is right now launching the fifth season of his popular podcast, Revisionist History. It's a podcast that touches on wide-ranging topics like art museums and elections and an Air Force general and uh, the dragon from Hobbit, or I should say a dragon from Hobbit. And Malcolm Gladwell joins us now. Uh, Malcolm, good morning, and thank you for being here. It's a great podcast, and I think people like it because they like you. They like the way you think. Uh, and so while I have you, I'm hoping we can get your thoughts on some of the news of the moment. Uh, you're famously the author of Tipping Point. Do you think when it comes to reforming police in this country and healing race relations in this country, we have reached a tipping point? Well, we're certainly a lot closer to a tipping point than um, in my memory. You know, one of the reasons in my last book, Talking to Strangers, I wrote about the case of Sandra Bland, one of those high profile, uh, uh, sad, tragic encounters between an African American and police. And I said in the book, the reason I wanted to talk about it is that we always have these incidents and then they go away. We, you know, we just go on with our lives. And this seems like the first time in a very long time that we're not content to go on with our lives. And that's incredibly encouraging. 
that's an important moment. I mean, in tipping point, you say you only need 30% or about 30% of a population to start changing the views and the culture of the entire population. And I think the polls would suggest we're, we're beyond that point. Um, but let's talk a bit about how that change happens. Uh, one of the most memorable slogans from the demonstrations is defund the police. But then you've got Republican lawmakers saying, actually, we need more money for police because we've got to retrain them in these new ways. Which side of that of that conversation do you come down on? Where's the evidence? Well, I'm on neither side at the moment. What I want to do is I want to sit down and let's decide what we want to do. How do we want to reshape uh, law enforcement for the 21st century to respond to these very real social realities? Once we figure out what we want, what, how do we want to retrain people? How do we want... I love some of the ideas about... Um, changing the, you know, removing certain responsibilities from the police. Why are, why do armed police do uh, traffic stops? Why do they do domestic disturbances? Uh, why do they deal with the homeless? Those are all things that maybe we should create another force that deals with those kinds of social problems. And once we figure out what we want to do, then let's figure out whether it costs more or less. It's crazy to start with the question of money. But money is going to be part of it. And if you're talking about changing the job requirements of police, I mean, when you look at it and you look at the evidence, do you think it's going to mean spending less on police or putting more money into it, at least in the short term, so that they can retrain and alter their behavior? Well, I tend to be someone who's suspicious of the idea that you could fix something without spending money on it. Uh, you know, it's a popular, lots of, you know, conservatives said for years things like the best way to solve. So I'm, I'm going to stop uh, there with that for, you know, not show the entire thing. Um, it gives you um, a little bit of background on um, Gladwell and a little better understanding of what is meant by tipping point. Um, if I was using this for my my classes with my students in um in preparing them to be teachers, one of the things I probably would point out in that video is how quickly um, the, um, the news media person transitioned into a polarizing topic. So, um, you know, he asked Gladwell about his stance on defunding the police, which is highly politicized topic. Um, and Gladwell goes into a really great um, description um, of where he would start in analyzing the problem um, he asked a lot of why questions. I would want to know why this and why that. And, and he basically demonstrates sy systems thinking. I mean, that's, he's demonstrating that right there. Um, and then very quickly, um, it gets lost on the media person who takes it right back and wants to um, keep talking about, you know, um, this, this uh, politi politicized um, idea that, that's going around right now. Um, and then I want to take you into... Uh, a clip, of, I'm not gonna show the whole thing again, but this is Bettina Love. All right, so good afternoon, Dr. Love. Good afternoon. We're very excited to be have you here with us, um, especially as we're getting into uh, your book, We Want to Do More Than Survive. So uh, thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, we wanted to start off with uh, this idea of mattering. So in chapter one, you uh, talk about this idea of we who are dark want to matter and live, not just to survive, but to thrive. Matter not for recognition or acknowledgement, but to create new systems and structures for educational, political, economic, and community freedom. It would mean we matter enough that our citizenship and the rights that come from, from with it are never questioned, reduced, or taken away, regardless of our birthplace or the amount of melanin in our skin. Um, just reading that right from the start, it struck a chord with both of us. Um, so we're hoping that you can speak more about why mattering in schools, why it's imperative for our students. Yeah, so, you know, I, I was, when I was writing the first chapter, the first chapter was supposed to be the introduction. And then my editor read it and said, oh, that's the first chapter. Um, because I really wanted to lay out this idea that we're in this moment where black folks and co-conspirators and people of color are saying, you know, black lives matter. But what does that mean to matter? Like we, we haven't gotten to that next step. And so I really wanted to talk about what I think it means to matter as a, as a black person. And 
to first of all to say that to be a black person or to be a person of color and to live is to live a life of exhaustion and so to be in this constant place of fighting for your humanity to be in this constant place of trying to argue and shout and protest that we matter we have to get back to thinking about what are we really asking and what do we want and i wanted to talk about that within schools and i wanted to talk about why mattering was so important and mattering to me is people see your humanity people see you as something that they are deeply tied to for their existence so not that i matter to myself i matter to you that our both but that our lives are tied together and that you are not good or you are not whole or you are not safe or you are not well or you are not healthy unless i am and so we have to find ways that we matter to each other and then we have to find ways that we make sure we matter politically economically socially spiritually to each other so i was trying to grapple with those ideas of what i think it means to matter and you know, and people say, well, I love, I love kids. I, I don't need you to love me. I need you to see that I, I don't need you to love, to respect me and see my humanity first. Then you love me. And so the idea to me was like, how can you, how can you love something you don't know? First, you have, first that person has to matter to you. And so, so I think um, I'm going to stop with, with that. Um, my, uh, and my reflection on on watching um, Bettina Love, what I, what I like about her and I like about that piece is um, it takes me back to um, the Dow study. And if you're not familiar with that, I, I encourage you to look it up. It's, it's um, associated with Brown versus the Board of Education and this idea of why it was so important to um, integrate schools that separate but equal just was not going to cut it. Um, and, and what it does to um, this, the psychological framework of students of color when they're um, growing up with messages from the media and um, mainstream society around cultural norms about what it means to be um, pretty or, or you know, attractive or good or bad. Um, and, and I think if I was using that clip, um, I probably would have would have tied that into that portion of of our curriculum that that I you know that's in the course that I teach. Um, the other reason I like Bettina Love and also D Watkins, it's D dot Watkins, um, is that um, I as a as a white female, especially as an older white female, um, you know it's not as powerful for me to take the words of Bettina Love. And and you know start reading them um, to actually have them speak for themselves. In fact, D. Watkins has a book um, called that. You know, speak for ourselves. Um, and in it, he talks about the need to pass the mic. Um, and so, hearing you know Bettina Love talk um, through through video um, and give her own her own voice, um, I think is very powerful and and a great tool for teachers that are trying to figure out how they might approach, you know, these topics in their classroom. And the last video I'll show you today is on um, Peter Senge. It's a, a two minute video. Well, the term systems thinking is really a, a mixed bag and I use it very, very cautiously. Uh, first, both words are problematic, but the word system is the most problematic. Because if you say the word system, the picture or image that pops up into most people's head is computer system. Like, you know, we need a systems expert here because our system's not working. The second most common association is management control system as it's not my fault. It's the stupid system, right? So these are the two associations that come first to people and neither of them is, is what we're trying to help people understand. So whenever I'm, I'm trying to help people understand what this word system means, I usually start off by saying, are you part of a family? Everybody is part of family. Have you ever been seen in a family, people producing consequences in the family, how people act, how people feel that aren't what anybody intends? Yep. How does that happen? Well, 
you know, then people can tell their stories and think about it. But that then ground grounds people in in not the jargon, you know, system or systems thinking, but the reality that we live in in webs of interdependence. A family is fairly close knit one. You can kind of see most all the key players. But still, even though we can identify maybe on a list of 10 or 15 names, here's all the key people in my immediate family. Still, the complexity of interactions amongst all those people is obviously such that consistently families produce outcomes that nobody wants, which is the other kind of, you might say, fundamental rationale for all of this. It's not to, quote, understand systems. That's an abstraction. It's to understand how it is that the problems that are the most vexing and difficult and intransigent that we all deal with come about. And obviously, to get a perspective on those problems that gives us some leverage and some insight as to what we might do differently. So um, this is the last slide before I, I turn it over to Dr. TK. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about micro and macro. And in my teaching, um, I, I use those words all the time and I get my students using them so they're comfortable understanding the difference. Um, certainly systems thinking is, is um, is taking a macro view, um, but I put it over here on the micro view as well because Senge met, talks about, um, he talks about the intangibles and that, that whatever can't be measured, um, it, like it's not important, um, which, which kind of reminds us of the reliance on test scores and quantitative measures, right? Um, and, and so we might look at quantitative, you know, analysis as kind of a, a macro, you know, analysis of what's going on in the district in terms of, of how students are doing. Um, but the micro gets at the individual level. Um, and, and so I mentioned qualitative research over here on the micro side, because if, if we aren't valuing qualitative research, then we're really, we're really, um, missing an opportunity to get at the individual level and to, to value individual voices. Um, so I, I didn't want to spend too much time on this because I'm already running over, but this, this um, diagram, I liked it a lot. It, it's from the National Equity Project um, and it, it's showing a lens of systemic oppre oppression. Um, so this would be a great tool for, for me that I would use in my social issues courses um, and maybe, you know, maybe um, for, for teachers in the classroom as well. Um, when I set up my courses, I will start macro. Um, I, I had said to, in the planning meeting, I was mentioning where I start with my students and I will start actually even outside the United States sometimes. Um, so if I can find a YouTube video discussing, discussing gender issues over in another country, I might start with, with that. <clears throat> and I do that because, because it's not as personal and it's not as close. So when we get to the individual side, we get into a lot of emotions. Um, and so, and, and people can structure their courses any way they want, but I'm, I'm only saying from my perspective, what's working for me <clears throat> is to start big <clears throat> and do a lot of analysis on societal structures. So over here on the macro, we, we're studying institutions, cultural norms, policy, economics. Um, and I've given you a couple books there. Um, so if we're looking at the stratified educational system, Diane Ravitch is great um, and, and her text is there. Um, if we're looking at segregated um, housing policies, um, Richard Rothstein on de jure, de jure and de facto segregation, um, and an analysis, historical analysis. It's, it's really hard for students to get upset about anything when you're looking at history and you're studying um, how policies and case law are, are, are evolving, how case law evolves into policy is, is fascinating for them. And once we get comfortable in looking at some, some societal structures of inequity, then 
I go back over to the micro and the individual side and we start looking at our own lived experiences, our own morals, values, beliefs. Um, before I, I turn this over, um, there's one more thing that I was supposed to do, but I ran out of time. And so very quickly, I just want to show you, because um, I wanted to actually take you into these, but I'm not. Um, New Hampshire, the governor, um, had the diversity panel resign. Um, he had said this was important to him. He had started it a couple years earlier um, and then did um, policy that was aiming to censor conversations that were essential to advancing equity inclusion. And it was primarily around race. So I'm giving you a national, kind of a national view, again, a macro view. Um, and then this, um, I pulled up today, Ohio State Board of Education to consider allowing critical race theory discussion. So they're, they're you know, having conversation about um, if, if OD, ODE, um, you know, how, if, if they're going to venture into this. Um, and I didn't, didn't read this article. Um, you can see conversation gets heated at Perrysburg Schools, which is um, a suburban school similar to Rocky River in the Cleveland area. Um, where parents are apparently coming to the Perrysburg School Board to have conversation about um, issues of, of critical race theory. Um, I'm not going to get into what critical race theory is, and I'm, and I'm not going to say to you that I think people are misusing the term, because I think, you know, I think we all kind of know that it's being used to, to mean anything. Anything that anybody wants critical race theory to mean seems to be... Um, you know, main, in mainstream society, it seems to be kind of thrown away, thrown around. So there is an academic um, version of critical race theory that really is critical race theory, right? That's very academic. And then there's this mainstream version out there. Um, I wanted to show you a local, a, a local issue, um, Rocky River parents fighting diversity. Um, in the planning meeting, when we got together, the three of us, I took them into all of these and, and, and they were, you know, could, could go in and look at, at everything. There's actually video from a school board meeting from Rocky River where you can look at the parents coming in and what their concerns are. Um, what concerns me about all of this is that social emotional learning is now under attack because of this. Um, because critical race theory is being thrown around by the media, um, by, by political parties, um, it's getting convoluted with social emotional curriculum um, and, and it's getting, the lines are getting very blurred. And so when we had our planning meeting, we wanted to make sure we talked about that um, because, because uh, K-12 has been so disrupted with COVID, um, we wanted to, to make sure that um, when, when we return and the schools are open um, this fall that um, everyone's coming back at least prepared, understanding that um, what's happening in Rocky River, what's happening in Perrysburg, or what's happening at the state level in Ohio, um, it, this may be the, the the big disruptor this year. Um, in addition, in addition to you know COVID, which still is is not completely um, taken care of. So um, I'm going to stop my share screen and um, turn things over to Dr. TK. Hi again, I'm TK Kirkendall. Um, I wanna start this section of the presentation by um, kind of engaging you all in a um, poll. Um, so my question is, what are some factors, uh, given um, Dr. Kottner's presentation there about the mi macro and micro level, considering the micro level as the individual level, that's the level at which you engage with people on a daily basis, your personal interactions, um, what are some factors um, that our viewpoint is based on? Um, if you can drop, um, just go to that poll and drop some one word or bigrams into the response. Um, I'll share out the responses here in a second. And uh, 
um, just for transparency, I kind of pre-launched the poll just to make sure that we had some feedback. So you'll see that there's already um, responses there. Um, so I opted to use the word viewpoint because I feel like some of the language now are kind of trigger words and uh, they have multiple meanings. They've been uh, made to have multiple meanings by different people and, um, and that can be shaped by people's viewpoint. So you might think of intersectionality, positionality, viewpoint, standpoint. Um, there's a lot of different terms that you can use, um, but I'm going to go with viewpoint because I feel like in this instance, in this moment in time, it's a more neutral term that other, that people can easily digest. Um, above the top, we have some examples of um, viewpoint and that there could be a fact that's true for um, everyone, but based on our viewpoint, we might see things differently. Um, and so I'll allow you some time to just take a look at that while I grab the results here and share them out. Awesome. Thank you for participating in the poll. Um, so as you can see, some of the factors, income, race, uh, gender ability, race and gender being the largest in the middle because those are some of the most popular responses. Um, the, the, the poll is still growing as people are, are responding, but gender and race are some of the biggest things. So our gender and our race kind of shade, um, color our viewpoint and, and shape how we go about the world. And just uh, Keep that in mind as uh, I continue on with the presentation. And so this part of the presentation really focuses on engaging with other people. And this is the engaging with civility. And so um, the next two parts are really talking about how we engage with civility. I'll focus mostly on the um, district level uh, staff, um, administrators and even the parent level. And then we'll, we'll follow up with the classroom level. And so, the reason your viewpoint is uh, important in, in considering how where you stand or where you see things from your positionality impacts um, us at, at the educational level um, is really encapsulated, uh, hopefully, on this slide. And you can throw in uh, sticky notes or pictures if you want to add to it. But um, the question I have is, what are some, let me advance my screen, I apologize. What happens when facts are viewed or discussed through micro and um, macro level viewpoints? And so I have this image here of what we can observe um, a black male um, and a white male police officer seeing each other. Um, those we can observe with our own eyes, but through lived experience and viewpoints, you know, the Black Bell perhaps sees in the officer something more, and the police officer sees in the Black Bell something more, again, colored by viewpoint, lived experience. Um, how this could play out in the classroom, in the school system is consider this Black Bell a parent of one of your students, and consider this police officer to be a resource officer in your school. So the way they engage with each other is shaped by their viewpoints, and so how they see the world, how they see facts, um, those are important. It's important to acknowledge and it's important to discuss. So what I'm going to do is offer two sets of um, kind of guiding principles, sets of guiding principles or goals um, to consider when engaging. And the first is to seek for um, intellectual humility, strive in for intellectual humility. And that's realizing that we know some things about some things, but we don't know everything about anything. And um, for the set of facts that we might hold from our perspective, um, other people from their perspective hold a different set of facts. And we then come with opinions based on those facts, but the goal is to leave our opinions about the facts 
to the side and have a civil conversation with each other um, in a way that allows us to strive for deeper meaning. And so that's letting go of our individual personal antidotes um, and then looking at broader trends and societal patterns as a guide for what's factual, what's actually occurring. Uh, someone may have stole my bicycle um, and that person might have happened to be a white person, but um, unless there's a trend of white people stealing bicycles, um, on a larger scale, that's anecdotal. It's not a fact that white people still bicycles. It's that kind of um, that kind of concept. And so, also um, interrogating your own reactions. Um, if you're defensive, using that as an entry point. Why am I experiencing this emotion about this topic? Critical race theory. Uh, masking in schools. Police shootings. Like, what is causing? your own reaction to it, interrogating that, uh, self-reflecting, and then using that as an entry point to gain deeper knowledge, as well as recognizing how your viewpoint or positionality shapes how you come to uh, feel a certain way about incidences or tipping points or disruptions. And I take this information from the Sensoy and D'Angelo text as pictured above. And then the next set of guiding principles is um, this idea of using civil discourse as the filter through which we process all of these disruptions or tipping points. And I take this set of uh, uh, guidelines from the US courts. And if you think in, in the institution, the court, this is where uh, polarizing topics are being debated and discussed, but it's imperative that it's done in a civil way. And so here are some guidelines that our US courts have outlined. Um, being mindful of your own behavior, again, that's self-reflecting on how you're coming to a discussion. Waiting, um, think about this in terms of a board meeting, um, which is now a common venue for people to discuss topics such as critical race theory, as we saw in the previous part of the presentation. Um, DEI meetings, staff meetings, community meetings, consider yourself as a parent, an administrator, as a teacher participating in these meetings and, and using these guidelines. Um, waiting to be recognized by the moderator or facilitator before speaking, which means not interrupting um, others are having side conversations so that you can really listen for the content that's being discussed and then trying to find common ground um, because again we all have maybe uh, are operating from the same facts but bring to it a different perspective based on our viewpoint and then following the direction of the conversation so that we're really commenting and discussing um, on what's happening in real time and not repeating ourselves or waiting for the next time to beat our point over someone's head. And then when you don't know or you're unsure where someone's coming from, what they mean, the intent or tone, asking questions, um, the why, why this? Why aren't we teaching critical race theory? Why is it a bad idea to do that? Why should we wear a mask? Ask the question why, get other people's feedback. And then don't embarrass yourself or be disrespectful by making inappropriate comments, rolling eyes, gestures. It's about being civil, allowing space for other people to engage, and then um, providing the opportunity for them to also allow you space to engage. And then again, differentiating between facts and opinions. And so my final slide, um, one of the quotes that I found to be um, really true from the Harvard Business Review, Bregman 2009 was, people don't resist change, they resist being changed. Just recognizing that we might come to a discussion and we don't necessarily change each other's minds, but what we might gain is a better understanding of where we stand. Um, and even think about school curriculum, adopting new curriculum, uh, implementing a new program. Sometimes people are resistant to those things. 
And it's not because they are rejecting your efforts, but maybe they're rejecting what they feel as a rejection of how they're doing things or themselves. So again, I ask um, and you to interrogate, you know, what's causing you anger, hurt, defensiveness, resistance, what's making you passionate with the, when discussing the topic, and then consider the underlying cause of those reactions and emotions, um, what's informing that perspective, and don't run away from disruptive or uh, polarizing topics. Talk about them, run to them, try to gain understanding um, and try to do that by asking yourself the questions. What questions do I have? What facts have I gathered on the topic? And then what other lenses have you attempted to view the topic through and use that as um, a way to um, invite yourself and others into a conversation with civility. And um, I'll turn it over to Will now to talk about what this looks like on the classroom level. Awesome, thank you very much, both Dr. TK and Dr. Kotner. I think a lot of your points are very, very relevant, um, especially in the time that we are in with um, coming out of a pandemic, as well as all of the kind of tension there is in society right now in America. And so as we transition to my part of the presentation, I want to kind of focus on how all of this might apply into the classroom. Um, and so taking a look at my own teaching experience, um, my own student teaching over the past year through the Master's Urban Secondary Teaching Program here at Cleveland State, otherwise known as the MUST program. Um, I wanna kind of focus on what kind of started my, at least interrogation of what practices really mattered to provide this kind of civil discourse and implementation into the classroom. Um, and so I considered I, the kind of like the, the point at which I started considering this kind of thinking was with my own moral dilemma. This, this past year I taught on, and in, a, in an urban setting in Cleveland, on the east side of Cleveland, and I, it was it was very easy for me to see the clear difference in upbringing that my students had compared to the one the upbringing that I've had. Um, I'm a white privileged male, um, and and a lot of my students come from very underserved backgrounds, and I really wanted to try and develop uh, teaching uh, strategies that really mattered for the students and, and really got my students to be not only interested, but also develop some of those really important critical skills. And so I found myself really trying to connect my content to the lives of my students. And so this is ultimately what I realized is that what got my students to be interested and then therefore develop skills in the classroom was not so much utilizing content that my, my like I had been interested in, it was more so forming it so that um, that that my students were interested in it. So kind of the idea of student choice, or if not so much having like student like specifically choose the content, at least forming the content so that it it relates to some sort of experience that the student has had. Um, and so providing that kind of space for student voice to be present in the classroom, I've found to be very important um, in, in the educational setting. And so I want to make a quick note before I move to the next slide here, it, that strategies that I talk about, you know, they're not exclusive. Um, these are all just ideas that I've come, come up with during my own teaching experience. And I I, I recommend some of them, but at the end of the day, it's it's all here for for discussion and food for thought. So I just want to make make that known that while while I think everyone should incorporate these ideas in some way, um, do apply it at your own discretion, kind of. So I want to look at um, a little bit of the literature, a little bit of the research that I've come in contact with that supports this kind of pedagogy in the classroom. And I actually want to reference some of the, the, the works that 
I, I read as a part of Dr. Kotner's Social Foundations class during my final semester here, um, getting my master's. And the, the, the class was generally set up as a survey class that looked at a, a, a wide array of various social issues within, um, within education. But simultaneously, we looked at a few kind of major works. And the first work uh, Dr. Kotner had referenced earlier in our presentation was by Diane Ravitch. And that book really focuses on a policy side, the policy perspective of education, and particularly um, Ravitch's uh, discussion puts in the question uh, the accountability movement and the school choice movement that we're still kind of seeing the effects of today. Um, the, the class then transitions from that work into the work that you see on the screen here with Deborah Hicks, which I will explain a little bit more in a moment. And then finally in the, in the, in the class, we look at a work by Paul Gorski that really focuses on some instructional strategies. Um, and so, Looking at Deborah Hicks's book, um, I found a lot of connection between the students that she 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 references and and um, kind of talks about in her book and her own experience with those students, and and I, I consider them to be a similar um, instructional strategy that she found effective that I found effective this past year in my own teaching experience. And so, just a quick context of the book, uh, she was teaching nine students in um, K through eight Appalachia, America, um, particularly in Cincinnati, Ohio. And these nine students came from very underserved backgrounds. Um, and they all had a very, in, in lack of a better word, rough upbringing. And so this particular um, part of the book that I have pasted here, photocopied here, focuses on a little bit of how- I didn't get that. Excuse me, Siri is acting up on me. Um, focuses on the, the realization and kind of the surprise that Hicks um, encounters in the content that actually got the students engaged. So I'm not gonna go through and read all of this here, but if you can see, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit to this. Um, somewhat highlighted section. Um, and so she references Blair and Blair is one of her students. And she realized, or Hicks realizes that it's actually that horror, horror genre, um, particularly with Stephen King, uh, is what the students really find connect with. And so this is a little bit of her reflection here on Blair. So it says, but Blair and my other students also faced bone crushing loss. Their child, their childhoods had been stolen from them. For the landscape in which they were coming of age was a haunted one. It was depressing, uncertain, sometimes fear provoking. People fought on the streets, dealers worked their corners, the unemployed were listless and ashamed. The air was foul with pollutants that would never be tolerated by the more privileged. Inside their homes, girls had the warmth of family love, but even this couldn't shield them from harm. The earlier Southern migrants had been poor at the start of their journeys to the city. But now with the loss of jobs and a street drug problem, the abuse of painkillers, the community's poverty was starting to spin out of control. The street's worst effects were tearing at, were tearing at the fabric of intimate family. Everywhere my girls turned, they found reminders of the demons they had to stare down just to make it to the other side of adolescence. In their improbable way, I was learning the horror stories of offered hope. Hapless heroines could outwit sinister spirits and crazies. Even the heroine of Rose Matter could find the inner strength of the, to defeat the horrifying monster that Norman had become. Spirits such as Blair's ghost Rose could speak out in angry voices, letting others know how trapped and alone they felt. I too was trying to create hope around the only form of transcendence I knew, an education rich in literature and reading. And so comparing that kind of reflection, you know, she was surprised at what really connected with the students. It was horror stories. Um, 
that wasn't necessarily something that she was originally interested in, but it's what the students connected with and that's what mattered. And so this reminded me of unit that I taught this past year, focusing on what was going to be relevant to the students. I had taught a unit on the kite runner um, by Khaled Husseini, and that unit in, was intended to have some sort of the, the oppressive connection or some sort of connection to the students re revolving around that idea of oppression. However, I was somewhat underwhelmed with the way that the students connected with it and I and I wanted to make a change in the content to try and motivate more of that connection and so I actually changed originally my plan to focus solely on Irish oppression literature and I, I connected that um, to uh, the the Harlem Renaissance literature and and how that in addition to connecting that to um, excuse me, the Huff riots of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, really, really mattered for the students. One of my students actually in, in that lesson where I, I compared the uh, Huff riots to the Harlem Renaissance literature said, you know, Mr. Fistek, my grandparents were literally a part of the Huff riots. They experienced this and they still talk about it regularly today. And for me, that was a profound experience, you know? something that I had chosen to do um, kind of on the fly and pivot, like a last minute pivot mattered for the students. And, and having that change in my own curriculum um, really, really struck out to me as being an effective way to connect content to the students. And so I realized, if you can see down here, as long as students were learning to critically think, then why not allow students to have this idea of choice in the content that they learn? Or at least, again, if it's not them specifically choosing the content, at least relating the content to the experiences that they've had. So I'm going to move to the next slide here. And in this slide, I want to focus on a few instructional strategies that might be able to be applied into the classroom. And so I know we are running on short on time, so some of this might seem a little bit short. However, feel free to um, utilize any of the, the information on this text or reach out to me if you have any questions. First one, which I'm actually very honored to be a part of Cleveland Teaching Collaborative and do a showcase um, of the, the resources within the referatory that uh, the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative has created um, is this idea of digital storytelling. And so in this, which is somewhat of a preview, of a page that will be posted onto the collaborative's website in their referatory shortly, it goes into what exactly is digital storytelling um, and, and how it can really be used to provide um, that perspective for, for students. So in very short, it's basically giving students the opportunity to create stories, um, utilizing videos and, and the digital space to, you know, create a little bit of a graphic for others to take in experience. And so um, I want to reference Dr. Buckley, who is one of the co-founders of CTC. I also was in her class over the past year, and we, we did a digital storytelling project that focused on um, the, the pre-service educators' um, experience with literacy, comparing it to our students, as we were in our practical experience as the educators um, interviewing and analyzing and, and really taking in that perspective of, of our students and then comparing and seeing some similarities and maybe some of those difference. And it was a really profound experience for me. Um, and I thought it was a really cool integration of technology into the classroom while also you know, providing that idea of civil discourse, of perspective building into the classroom. Um, secondly, is the idea of a humans project. And this inspiration comes from the Humans of the New York project, which was essentially started in, if you couldn't tell, the city of New York, where a gentleman went around originally simply photo documenting any person he saw on the street of New York City. And he said, hey, Every person has their own perspective. Why not create a little bit of a photo documentary series where take a photo of this person, 
talk to that person and then provide a little of that person person's story into a series of um, essentially onto this website. And so as I scroll through here, just real quickly, you can see some of the latest stories here and the people that he was able to interview. But this project has really um, expanded and grown as he also has different countries, um, as well as different kind of just all, all over the place, which is really cool and really inspiring. And so that's another kind of idea that um, you can implement into the classroom to not only give the student that kind of choice, but then also to develop a culture where students reflect, interact, and engage with each other, again, promoting that idea of civil discourse and providing those critical skills of, okay, well, I don't necessarily have the same background, but that's okay, and I respect that. Um, so then less of these final two, I guess, strategies aren't so much project based or, or like project ideas so much as they are just kind of like mentality, like how you can go about um, approaching the design and implementation of pedagogy into the classroom. And so the first idea or concept that I want to just briefly touch on is the idea that the teacher is in some ways developing to be more of a facilitator and, and not the bearer of all knowledge. In other words, it's going away from the idea um, that the, the teacher is the sage on the stage. And so um, there's a, there is an article that provides a little bit of literature on this concept, but essentially providing more, more room for that student choice, providing more student conversation into the classroom I feel is very effective in not only engaging the students, but also allowing them to critically um, develop those critical, critical skills. And then this kind of flows directly into um, the neutrality. Um, the, the idea that teacher as facilitator, and then um, in some ways allowing the, the, the teacher to be somewhat neutral in, in providing or interjecting opinions. I didn't want to put any specific literature on this because when just in my quick Google search on neutrality, um, it is a very divided issue right now, um, or at least the literature that comes up on Google is, um, where you know on one end of the, the spectrum, it is important to stay somewhat out of it, right? You don't wanna interject your own personal political opinions and, and and you want to kind of provide a space for all of the students so that they feel comfortable to talk and whatnot. But at the same time, there is a certain genuine authenticity in, you know, saying, okay, this might be a perspective that I come from, but it's more so, it's just an idea to grapple with. And it's a strategy that I'm saying, you know, just think about as you imply it, or as you think about potentially applying it to your own classroom, using neutrality, not using it, finding the right space for it. Um, but I still think it's a powerful concept nonetheless. And so um, as I'm wrapping it up here, um, the uh, just three very quick focus points that I've ultimately um, come to realize as a result of kind of going through this presentation, all the planning that we've done for it is how important it is First, how important it is to try and understand the students and where they come from. Um, secondly, by utilizing choice in the student's background into the classroom instruction, especially when applying that content to the generalize, generalizable skills, critical skills, you know, then why not? Um, th then, then if you do that and you allow the content to be chosen more or less by the students, then you provide an unpolarizing educational solution for many perspectives are respected. And then lastly, um, the whole idea that by respecting these different perspectives, you are open to change, but you're not forcing that change on others. Um, and so as we finish up here, we all wanted to leave our contact information. These are our emails on this slide. So if anyone wants to reach out, wants to have more conversation about these ideas, um, feel free to, and we would love to kind of further this conversation. But other than that, uh, from all of us, I want to really say thank you for the opportunity to present here and really enjoy the, the work that Cleveland Teaching Collaborative has to offer. So thank you.
Wow. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly comprehensive and really thoughtful presentation. I really appreciate the team that you brought together, Glenda, Will, and TK, such different perspectives and really helpful the way you transition from, from part one to, to three, um, all the way to the classroom level with Will's closing there. Um, I, there was a session yesterday, one of my favorite scholars is Nicole Mira, and one of her latest frameworks is critical civic empathy. And she and Antero Garcia just posted an article on the Hill yesterday and I will post the link to that, but all your conversation just fed so nicely into, you know, thinking about how we treat our colleagues, how we approach what we assume about others and really actively creating ways for that civic discourse to happen. So I thank you. I could tell a lot of thought went into your project and your presentation. So um, thank you for sharing it with the collaborative. I'll pause if there are any additional comments to share? No, I just want to echo what Molly said and say thank you. I think that um, you three have definitely inspired me to be more intentional about things I sort of implicitly do in my teaching and have in the back of my head, but really to make that explicit and to use terms like micro and macro and to, you know, bring that another step further for my students and for me. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. And Thank you for the opportunity because without this format, this collaboration wouldn't have happened. And um, TK and Will and I, we would get together for planning and we would just be on for two hours and <laughs> we would go off, you know, but we had some wonderful conversations and really, um, you know, became kind of a critical friends network. So I, I really appreciate the format. One Thank thing you. that I really appreciate through this experience too, you know, it's somewhat of a leveling experience, right? I, I had Dr. Kotner, I had Dr. Buckley, who are very well versed in the in the literature and the, the research that both of, everyone does. Um, but myself just finishing my master's, you know, and, and when it comes to the degree side of things, you know, I don't have that same credential. And so what Cleveland Teaching has Cleveland Teaching Collaborative has allowed me to do is have that conversation with people who are a little bit more qualified than I am. And I've really appreciated that ability to, to, you know, in some ways level the playing field and just say, Hey, let's have this conversation. Let's move forward together. Um, and I think that's part, partly um, right in line with kind of what we've talked about today. So uh, again, thank you. I also just want to say thank you for providing this platform. I think it's amazing work that you're doing and uh, the referatory, that's awesome. And I look forward to seeing what other projects and um, presentations come out of this work. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Glenda, TK, Will. Awesome job. It will be posted in the referatory and you can share it with others and students as we go forward. So hope to see you again. Um, on the referatory or the CTC site soon.